three main issues that we're going to go through this evening. Who goes through the tribulation and why? I mean, is God just wanting to harm the earth? I mean, why is he, why is this so planned? In fact, this period of time, the tribulation through the millennium, is 20 some percent of the Bible. So it's, I mean, of the whole Bible. Of the 1,189 chapters, one-fifth of them are about all this. So why? Uh, and, and who is he planning to go through? And then who can be saved uh, during the tribulation and how? Uh, and, and by the way, as we go through these verses, these are persistent questions that people ask. Uh, during that era when uh, Tim left behind LaHaye was writing, pumping out those books, many people, I mean, you could hear people talking about this at Walmart, and, and it just was on their hearts. So how do you answer that? And then f really, uh, where it will be most wonderful this evening, what lessons can we as believers get from what Jesus taught about the tribulation? Why, if we're not even going to be here, is there such extensive teaching to the church about all these issues. Why was the book of Revelation given to the church? The book of Revelation wasn't given to uh, the people that survived the tribulation, it was given to us. And so what is God's intention? So let's start with the first one. Uh, the seven year tribulation, who goes through it and why? And, and start with me in the book of Jeremiah. And, and I wanna show you something. You actually need, uh, if you can, uh, open to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is one of those great books of the Bible. Uh, when, you, when you get to uh, Hebrew class, you find out that there are more Hebrew words in the book of Jeremiah uh, than in any other book of the Bible. This, this is the, the big book as far as uh, in total number of words. But look at Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. That's where we're going to start. Uh, who goes through the tribulation and why? Number one, Israel. Why? Because it's the time of what the Bible calls Jacob's trouble. And, and you, you might, and, and I want to show you the, per, the principle of the greater context. You say, Jeremiah 30, this verse pulled out, just stuck on the board, says, for that day is great, we're not sure what day that is, so that none is like it, and we're not sure the context of that, and it's the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. What is this talking about? Is this talking about the patriarch, Jacob? Is he uh, being troubled by the Amorites of the hill country of, 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 you know, the promised land. What is going on? And so if you look in your Bibles, the, you know, it's talking much about something about Israel. And verse 10 of the same chapter says, don't, be, don't fear, don't be dismayed, I will save you, um, and, and all of that. But when you get across to the next chapter, you see the wider context. Remember I told you that one-fifth of the Bible, this is a very large section talking about, remember who Jeremiah is, the weeping prophet, the prophet, prophet that presided over the decline and fall and destruction and captivity of Jerusalem. He served four decades and didn't have one response. Imagine someone as well known as Billy Graham preaching continu continuously for four decades and not one person ever walked forward. That's Jeremiah's life. But look what he, in his primary ministry, uh, ongoing was this writing ministry. Look at chapter 31, and, and I'll start in verse 3. The Lord has appeared of old to me and said, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. That is a beautiful verse. Many people claim it. It's highlighted and underlined in their Bible. But look at the next one. Again, I will build you and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin daughter of Israel. Something is going on that has to do with Israel. Look at verse 8. Behold, I will bring them from the north country. Bring who? Israel. From where? The north country. The context of this verse is chapter 31. And chapter 31 says God is going to be doing something with Israel. He's going to bring them from the north country. Verse 8 continues, and gather them from the ends of the earth. And verse 9, they'll come with weeping and with supplication. Do you know what's fascinating? Jeremiah was presiding over the prophetic office of Israel as Nebuchadnezzar destroys Jerusalem. And the 2,600 years of what's called by Jesus the times of the Gentiles began. 
Israel lost their sovereignty. They lost their nationhood. They lost having a king ruling over them. They lost being independent among the nations. And they began to be trampled, and they were actually dispersed. First, they were dispersed, you know, by the Assyrians and the Babylonians spread them around, but they stayed primarily in, in the Egypt to Iraq, Iran area. But then when Rome came, Rome sent them, remember the four we looked at this morning, the four, Babylon was the first, Rome's the last. Rome sent them to the far ends of the earth. And look at this. This is a future time. It says, behold, I will bring them, that's Israel, from the north country and gather them from the ends of the earth. Did you know today Israel, now since 1948, it's become a nation. They now have citizens of Israel from one country hundred different countries of the world. I don't know if we have that in America. We're the melting pot. Israel is the ultimate. They have Israelis from 100 countries around the world. 100 different cultures and languages are reflected within Israel. And it's interesting, the majority, more than half of the nation of Israel today alive in Israel, more than half of them are from verse 8, the north country. They're Russians. Isn't that interesting? Half of Israel are from Russia. Now, that's an amazing coincidence, or it is God's word writing history in advance, telling us about what's going to happen at the end of days. So you can decide. And they come with weeping. Verse 9, you can watch the documentaries. When they come on, on this aliyah, when they return to the land, those people, when they come down the, the steps of the airplane or wherever they're getting off, they drop down and they kiss the ground and cry. They can't believe that they made it back to their land. Verse 10, Hear the word of the Lord, O nation, declare it the isles afar off. He who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him like a shepherd does his flock. And on and on, and, and you can read, and Jeremiah is filled with that. So the time of Jacob's trouble is fulfilling, and if you just want to read more, Romans 9 through 11, Paul is talking about God's sovereign election of Israel. And uh, if you at all believe in God's sovereignty or in his election, you know that he doesn't change his mind. And he sovereignly elected Israel, the nation, the ethnic descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Romans 9 through 11 tells us that God is going to bring them back until they believe, but they don't get a free ride. They are going to go through the most horrible time that you heard about this morning where the Antichrist is going to persecute him. Secondly, not only is Israel going through the whole world, the seven-year tribulation, who goes through it and why? Why is this tribulation? Number one, the, the first and most important thing that God is doing in the tribulation is saving Israel. And you're seeing the stirrings right now. It's phenomenal what's going on in Israel. One of my friends is involved in a church planning ministry there, uh, I mean, a large church planning ministry. And this ministry is primarily working among the Russian immigrants because the Russians that came to Israel have lived in Russia for so long and heard the gospel so long. And even though they're Jewish, they're not blinded and hard-hearted like so many of the people that have lived generations in Israel. And they are listening to the gospel being preached. And there are right now more messianic congregations. What I'm talking about is people that believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah in Israel than there have been since the time of the apostles. I mean, it is unbelievable what's going on. And, and the, the rabbi, everybody, the head of all the different Hasidic parties in Israel don't know what to do with it. Because that's the last thing they want is Christianity, they call it. And so, so it's for Israel, but the whole world. See what Daniel 7.23 says? Thus he said, the fourth beast is a fourth kingdom on earth, which will be different than all other kingdoms, and it devours the whole earth. So this, this coming uh, final cataclysm is global. Uh, it says, Jesus said this. Look what Jesus says in Luke 21, 35. We're going to actually look at, at the end, at the whole 21st chapter. Jesus gives to us what I call the, the tribulation survival guide. And it's, it's everything that people in the tribulation need to know. And you know what you find out? 
It's kind of like when I lived in California. They said, you know what? Someday you might go through an earthquake, but if you don't go through an earthquake and the power's just off for a couple hours, you'll be glad you did this. And you had your little box of everything you needed if there was no power and the grocery stores closed. It was just this little preparation. Jesus kind of gives that to us in Luke 21. And we'll look at that. But look what he says. For it will come as a snare. This is Luke 21 is parallel to Mark 13 and Matthew 24. That is Jesus talking about prophecy. And these three chapters are the Olivet Discourse. And look what Jesus says right in the middle of him discussing the end of the world. He says it will come, it is the tribulation, it is the end of the world, will come like a snare. Now how, who all is involved in the snare? All those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. So God says everybody, everybody alive and breathing when the tribulation starts is going through this event. And then Revelation 13, it was granted to him, again it's the beast, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints. Now isn't it interesting um, that, that, that we saw in Daniel 7 the very same thing this morning? He's making war with the saints. Uh, this is with the, the, what we're seeing the beginning of that's going on in Israel right now. This is with the people that are being saved through the two witnesses, 144,000, and the angel that's preaching. This is everybody that's left on earth that, that responds to God. The Antichrist is fighting them and to overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. He's going to totally control the earth. So, the whole world. Who can be saved during the tribulation and how is the second question. So, I mean, it's it's for Israel, but it's to pour out God's wrath on uh, the world that has rejected Christ so long. But during this time of Jacob's trouble, which is for Israel's benefit, and the the great tribulation, which is for mankind uh, who wants to live without God, It's kind of like, you know, you ever had someone say, oh, I don't need you, and so they let you find out what it's like, you know, like that treasured employee, uh, and you're not, you don't really know how much you need them, and you say, oh, it's okay, and you let them go, and everything falls apart. That's what happens in the tribulation. The world says, we don't need God. God says, okay, I'll let you see what it's like when you don't need me, and he just lets the horrors that he's been withholding all this time. Did you know that that there are four angels penned up in the Middle East, they're over by the Euphrates River, that are so bad, God has not let them out. They are so malignant, they are so evil, they are so wicked, and there are so many demons that, that won't stop destroying humanity. So God's kept them penned up. He says, you guys want to make it on your own? I'm going to let them out. And see, that's, that's what's coming. But uh, who can be saved during this seven-year period of time? And how are people saved? Well, first, and, and, and if you look at, at Joel 2.32, you all know this verse. This is what Peter is quoting on the day of Pentecost, par, a portion of it, as he's preaching. But look, look what Joel says. And it shall come to pass, come to pass when? Well, if, if you have a minute, get to Joel. And I want to show you the context again. Remember, context is king of understanding anything in the Bible. And it's Daniel, where we were this morning, Hosea, Joel, Amos. So Joel, chapter 2. And, and it starts out in chapter 2 with the, the context. So to understand the context of Joel 2, and always, whenever you see a verse anywhere pulled out, whether it's on a plaque, you know, or on a card or somewhere or in a Bible study, make sure you cruise around to see what is the context of that verse. And it starts out in verse 1 of chapter 2 of Joel, trumpet in Zion, the sound alarm uh, in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Why? For the day of the Lord is coming. It is at hand. Now, Joel uses the day of the Lord as synonymous with what we would call the tribulation. He calls it the day of the Lord. It's the day that the Lord starts pouring out 
his promised wrath. So there's a day of the Lord is coming. What is it like? Verse two, a day of darkness, gloominess, a day of clouds, of thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, the people come great and strong, like uh, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generation. And then it starts talking about verse four, the appearance of horses and their swift and the sound of chariots. But look at verse 10, more and more and more. By the way, this first part is talking about the, the, the horrors of the warfare. When we get to chapter six a little bit further, we're gonna talk about the warfare, the tribulation, and all this marching in rank and formation. And you know what's fascinating? I mean, what might be, you know, you, you never know. The longer we live, the more this makes sense. Did you know they are developing drones? And I don't mean on Star Wars. I mean real ones. I mean real drones. And, and MIT recently let out a batch of their drones, and these little flying things did a synchronous little, it was kind of like a little show for all the scientists. All these drones were controlled by a computer to, to move like, have you ever seen birds, how they all kind of flit and fly together? A whole flock of blackbirds will go and then they'll all land. And you think, how are they all communicating? Now they have developed the drones that they will all work and keep equidistant from each other flying and going all over the place. This very much sounds like something robotic, that, that they climb over walls, they don't break ranks in verse seven, they don't push one another, verse eight, they march in his own column, and they're not cut down because they're probably not alive, they run to and fro, they climb the walls. I mean, it's, it's worse than any movie what's gonna happen on the earth. But look at verse 10, the earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, the stars diminish in their brightness. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 24, in Mark 13, in Luke 21. He's talking about this, this cosmic disturbance. And so the sun is growing and the moon are growing dark. The stars are diminishing in their brightness and the Lord gives voice before his army. His camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word. It's the day of the Lord. The Lord is the one. It's not the Antichrist. It's not the devil. It's the Lord that has timed and planned and described and executes the tribulation. But look at what, right in the middle of this, God is characterized as being a savior. In fact, Titus repeatedly, Paul in the book of Titus, calls God our savior. His character, his, his changeless quality is love, God. So while the Lord is, is doing this in verse 11, for the day of the Lord is great, very terrible, who can endure it? But the Lord says in verse 12, now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, rend your heart and not your garments, return to the Lord your God, he is gracious, he is merciful. Look at that. When, when all of, of the world is, is crumbling, and now keep going to verse 32, because that's, the, that's where we're headed. The context is this day of the Lord, and, and all that the Lord is doing. Verse 30, on the way to 32, I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood. Sounds just like it says in the New Testament. Before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And look where that verse gets. It gets in one of the most used chapters of the Bible called the Romans Road, you know, the gospel presentation by the Apostle Paul in Romans 10. He, he pulls this verse right out of Joel. In fact, if you look at Paul's salvation presentation in the book of Romans, he quotes from a dozen Old Testament passages. Where did Paul get his gospel presentation from the Old Testament? Because God is a savior. And so who can be saved during the tribulation? Number one, the first answer that the Lord gives is anybody who calls in the name of the Lord. That's what God says. Now, where did this notion come that if anybody heard the gospel before the, tribul or before the rapture, they won't be able to be saved after? Part of where it came from is, it's, it's kind of like a, if you've ever been like at a timeshare presentation, they say, you know, they keep lowering the price and lowering the price. Finally, they say, if you get up from this table, 
you'll never be able to get this at that price again. It's a selling technique. It's kind of like going to seal the deal now. And, and many zealous teachers have said, if you don't respond now, you'll never have a chance again. Well, does the Bible actually say that? So uh, this, this is a second a second group of people who can be saved during the tribulation, those who receive a love of the truth. Because in 2 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul is telling us who can't be saved during the tribulation. And it's the same group of people that couldn't be saved in Thessalonica in the first century and can't be saved at Calvary today. I think that we need to realize that salvation is of the Lord. See, that's the book of Jonah, chapter 2. Salvation is of the Lord. The Lord has got to do something. Look what it says. And with all unrighteous deception, this is talking about the Antichrist and everything going on during the tribulation time, amongst those who perish. So this is the people who are dying during the tribulation and are going straight into the waiting room, going to the great white throne, and going to be condemned to eternal damnation. Why are they not getting saved? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. This is very important because we sometimes tell people, oh, if you just pray this prayer, you can go to heaven. But we should caution them to say, if you pray this prayer, and by the way, there's no, we, we don't have to make it hard for people to get saved. I've heard some people's gospel presentations, and I'm not sure I would make it because you have to almost, you know, have a doctorate in theology before they can share the gospel with you because you've got to know everything. That's not how it is. The Lord said that you come as a child. And you have to think of Jesus doesn't exaggerate. He says you have to have childlike faith, not PhD in theology. But when God saves someone, see, salvation is of the Lord. When God saves someone, on the inside something happens to them. See, we only can touch the outside. We only can, can, you know, give them the word from the outside. But on the inside, the Lord is at work. And what the Lord does inside their heart is give them a love for the truth that they might be saved. You know, I was thinking, you know, my wonderful wife, it's, you know, I'm very distracted when she sits in the audience. I always know right where she is and I can see her eyes. But I remember her story about how she came to Christ. She had a little Gideon Bible in the bottom of her backpack and she pulled it out and said, if you're real, show yourself to me. And she started reading that. And I bet there's a lot of words that she didn't pronounce right. And I bet that uh, there's a lot of terms she didn't understand. But at the end, she bowed before the Lord fell to her knees, and he gloriously saved her. What happened? He, the Lord, gave to her and to all of us who have been saved the love of the truth that we might be saved. Did you know there's a lot of people that know the facts, but they don't love the truth? You know how I know they don't love the truth? When you're saved, 1 Peter 2, 2 says, you're just like a baby. You can't get enough of milk. And, and as a newborn baby, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, desires the sincere milk of the word, that's the sign of new birth. That's the sign of salvation. That's the sign of loving the truth. The truth is the word of God, revealing God to us. And a born-again person gets hungry. Now, we raised enough kids to know the first thing the doctor, I mean, 20 years ago, when children were sick and you'd call on the telephone, they had a cord that went all the way into the wall, um, you know, and you'd say, oh, you know, Johnny's sick. And the doctor would always say, does he still have his appetite? Bring him in Monday. This is over the weekend. Bring him in Monday. Yeah, he'll be okay. Still has his appetite. If he loses his appetite, bring him in right away. Take him to emergency. But if he still has his appetite, bring him in Monday. Well, I know he saved us a $50 office copay, but but isn't that dangerous? No. If they have their appetite. And you know what we're seeing in the church today? An incredible number of people that claim to be a Christian that don't love the truth and don't have an appetite. And we just go, oh, that's all right. You're still saved. They should be rushed to the emergency room. And they should be checked if they're really saved. Because really saved people 
In order to be saved, you have to have a love of the truth. Okay. Who can be saved during the tribulation? Those who are not deceived and those who do not take the mark of the beast. Now, look at Revelation 14, 9 to 11. And, and this is a good one to, to mark in your Bible if you haven't yet noticed it. Um, because what it, it's full of some incredible truth. And the third angel... Uh, it's a proclamation of three angels. And, and the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, verse 9 of Revelation 14, if anyone worships the beast, who is the beast? It's the person introduced in chapter 13. Who is the person introduced in chapter 13? It's the one that has all those titles that we're looking at. That's 27 chapters already we've seen. It's the Antichrist. But Verse 9 says, if anyone worships the beast and his image, what's the image? That's the little idol that the false prophet makes and, and makes come to life. And, and all the people are, are worshiping this, this idol of the Antichrist. If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. You know what people have just gone ballistic over? You know, I'm not going to get that implant. I'm, I don't want a passport with that RFID chip. I'm not going to get a social security number. I don't want to get the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is not going to be snuck up on anybody. The mark of the beast is going to be obeying this global ruler. Not obeying him like parking your car between the lines and going the speed limit like obeying him as God. And, and when, you, when you submit to him, he marks you as part of the club, and, and you have choices. It's on your forehead or on your hand. Uh, he himself also shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, the people that worship him, which is poured full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone from the presence of the Lord and the angels and the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. So, who can't be saved during the tribulation? I mean, that's where this whole thing came from. Actually, they said, uh, actually, the original question that, that someone gave me was, um, I thought that people who heard the gospel before the rapture couldn't be saved after the rapture. Well, that's really not the question that should be asked. The question is, who can be saved during the tribulation? And who can be saved during the tribulation? is anyone who calls the name of the Lord, but most people won't call on the name of the Lord. It says in the ninth chapter of Revelation, if you were looking at that, it says, neither would they repent of their murders and their fornication and their thefts and their drugs. Even when the hailstones are 100 pounds in weight and they're falling all around them, squashing and killing and knocking everything down. And even when those four angels are coming out with their huge hundreds of millions of demon armies. And even when the sun is turning dark and the moon is like blood. And even when there's no water and the sun is scorching them, even then they won't repent. So whoever calls the name of the Lord will be saved. Everybody that receives love of the truth and whoever is not deceived and won't take the mark of the beast because if anyone does, they will have torment that ascends forever and ever. And by the way, the one that invented the eternal nature of hell is not screaming Baptist preachers. God did. No, no, I was talking to someone, and they said, well, they go to one of those churches where they scream all the time, and I thought, well, what does that mean, you know? As if, it, as if they're, they're, you know what I mean? I mean, it's uncomfortable to hear screaming, and I don't like screaming, and you know what I mean, but it doesn't mean it's wrong if they scream it, and it's true. God says that as long as eternal life lasts, so does eternal death, and death is separation from God and paying for our sins, and our sins have an eternal payment. And either that eternal payment was paid by Christ, or we have to pay for it forever. Now, here's another one that's fascinating. Those who are not deceived and don't take the mark of the beast is secondly described right here in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And this ties in with what I was talking about this morning about the Antichrist being the greatest persecutor of all time. Now, why don't you think of the implications of that? Look what it says. And I saw thrones. This is Revelation 20, um, which, which starts with the millennium and ends with the great white throne. I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been... 
You know what's fascinating about that? Beheaded. Did you know that God says that the Mediterranean world is the, the focal point of the end of the world and the Roman Empire there? You know what most people don't think about? The Roman Empire. More than half of the Roman Empire in the time of, of the apostles, that land area, more than half of it today is under the domination of Islam. Isn't that fascinating? Did you know that the, the part of the Roman Empire that continued all the way to 1453 AD, the, the Eastern Empire, the Byzantine Empire, Constantinople, did you know that that half of the empire is about 90% Islamic? What is the favorite means of execution with Islam? Right there. Isn't it interesting? We think of the Roman Empire as German. It wasn't. We think of the Roman Empire as Italian. It wasn't primarily. That, those are the minority countries. The majority of the Roman Empire was Northern Africa, the Middle East, what we would call the Fertile Crescent, what we would call Turkey, what we would call, you know, all through the, the Balkan area. They only had the fringe. They didn't go all the way into Germany, the Roman Empire. They didn't go all the way into France, the Roman Empire. They didn't go all the way in. They, they built a wall across Britain because they couldn't conquer, and they barely held those outposts. The majority of the Roman Empire is now populated by Islamic people. That's a fascinating thought, and this is a preferred means of doing someone in. But whatever the implications are, the Antichrist beheads people because of their witness to Jesus and for the word of God and wouldn't worship the beast or his image and wouldn't receive his mark on their forehead or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, basically, all that is saying is, and it says in chapter 6, it says in chapter 5, it says in chapter 7, and again in 14, that there is this huge multitude of the book of Revelation of people that are not willing to go along with this chapter 13. Come on. Doesn't want to go back. No. Doesn't. Oh. How do you like that, Dan? I broke it. Well, maybe it's time to go. Uh, that won't go along with, uh, there we go, no. <gasps> it crashed on me. Well, I don't care. They won't go along. They won't go along with the beast and they're martyred. And out of their martyrdom, they populate heaven. And they are surrounding the throne in their white robes, singing, worthy is the lamb but it's because they wouldn't take the mark of the beast. So who cannot be saved? Those who don't receive the love of the truth, those who are deceived, uh, those who take the mark of the beast, and those who refuse to call on the name of the Lord. Well, I was going to take you to chapter 21 of Luke, and I think we'll just start there in two weeks, because Jesus Christ gives, and I'll just introduce it to you. What lessons can believers today get from the tribulation coming? The best preparation for the tribulation is what I call Christ's tribulation survival guide, which he taught in Luke 21. And what he does is he gives us 12, what, what are really beautiful, 12 steps that you can prepare for the tribulation. You know what I found? I've studied every one of these. I've been spending, since someone asked this last week, I've, I've been plowing and choosing and going through these. And you know what? Every one of the 12 steps Jesus said to the Jews to get ready for the tribulation are incredibly wise areas that each of us should be thinking about today. Because we're, remember the tribulation is just an amplification of what's going to be going on across the world prior to the tribulation. And the deception and all of the fear and all of the terror and all of the, the people's hearts failing them for fear, we're seeing pockets of that right now. And so what people during the tribulation, the Jews are supposed to have from Christ to get ready for that, it's pretty wise to get those same principles down now. And so that's where we'll start in a couple of weeks. So let's take a moment to bow our heads in a word of prayer, and then we're going to actually continue uh, the service with the induction of two of our newest members. 
and uh, greet them tonight, and we'll be right on time. Father in heaven, I thank you that every single one of us that are here tonight that is bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, sealed by his spirit, and headed toward heaven, have received a love of the truth, implanted in our hearts by you, our God. We love you. We love that you are the way, Lord Jesus, and you are the truth, and you have brought us life. And I pray that we would be such lovers of the truth that, that it would be that, that your word is more than our necessary food, that we would decide even tonight that your word is more important than all of our social media, all of our gaming, all of our recreational pursuits, all of our financial pursuits, that you are more necessary, that feeding our soul with truth, because that's how we were saved, by the engrafted truth, James said, that is able to save our souls. I pray that we'd get serious about feeding our souls the truth of your word. And I pray that you, the spirit of truth, would minister the word of truth and that you would inflame our love of the truth, that we would be those who will be guarded against deception. And we'll thank you for what you do. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.